appreciate you being here this morning. I mean that. I know this is a busy time of year and a lot's going on and trust maybe even today you'll be able to spend some time with family and uh, cherish your mother and treat her special. Hope you found your spot. Second Timothy chapter number one. We'll be there in just a moment. All right, as I like to do in Mother's Day and Father's Day, I like to share some funny statements or such. And uh, here are some observations of mothers that they have made down through the years, different ones and so forth. And I think they're, they're good and funny all at the same time. And so here's one of them. Uh, one mother observed this, uh, said simply this, it's ironic we celebrate the kid on the anniversary of the day their mom did all the work. That's the child's birthday, and I think that's true, amen, and uh, that's probably true. I like this one. This hits close to home uh, for me and Erica. People who say they sleep like a baby usually don't have one. That's true, isn't it? Those of us who were woken up and those, some of us who slept through that. But anyway, uh, nonetheless, I like this one too. This is a little bit maybe more modern if we could put it this way. And uh, I think, uh, moms, you might want to say this today. My kids can never make fun of me for teaching me how to use my phone. I taught them how to use a spoon. <laughs> nah. That's a good payback, isn't it? All right, they, these millennials and others try to say, hey, you don't know how to use a phone. All right, tell them you taught them how to use a spoon. That, that'll take care of that, and I think that's good, all right, okay? This is so very true, isn't it, moms? Dads, too, but moms, silence is golden unless you have kids, and silence is suspicious. And that's true, amen? Yeah, I think that's exactly it, and uh, it's good. And Now, I, 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 I'll test. I'll use this one. This is good, okay? Uh, what three words solve dads every problem? Ask your mother, amen, <laughs> and uh, amen, ask your mother, and go to her, amen, and uh, like that, then this is a good one too, and one mother said this, what's the fastest land mammal? A toddler who's been asked what's in their mouth. <laughs> then have you done that, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, what's in your mouth? Vroom, they're gone, all right, and uh, some good observations from moms, and uh, hope that brings a smile to your face on this Mother's Day. We'll share a few more that kind of pertinent to or appropriate for our message here in just a moment. For now, let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I hope you found it. We'll look at verse 1 and following. Read down through verse 6, if you will, with me. Paul's writing. He says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. We're introduced in this little passage to a great group of believers. And uh, certainly, first of all, there's Paul, right? Paul is the one who is writing this letter. And uh, he is the one who is, in fact, he mentions it three times. Did you catch it? He says, I'm remembering some things. Or he's speaking of how he remembers some things. And so uh, that's Paul. Then there is Timothy. Even in this passage, refers to him as his son in the faith. Okay, they're not blood related, as far as we can tell, but he is certainly a father figure in the faith. Paul is for Timothy, and so he's writing to Timothy here in this letter. And uh, in this letter, then we are introduced to two other people: his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. And I think that's appropriate, obviously, for our consideration on Mother's Day. Well, the question is, how, how did this relationship start? Why is Paul writing to Timothy, first of all? And why is Paul mentioning Lois and, and Eunice? Why, why is that so crucial and important that here in the New Testament, it's something that Paul is remembering? Well, their story or their connection starts in Acts chapter 16. Turn with me there. Keep your spot here. We'll be right back here. Only two passages we'll look at. But look at Acts chapter 16, if you will, with me. And we'll kind of get a little um, glimpse into or a little understanding of how this all started between Paul and this family mentioned here. Acts chapter 16, keep your spot in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll be right back there here in just a moment. But Acts chapter 16, look at verse 1. We'll read down through verse number 3 uh, with me. Then came he, that he is speaking of Paul. You look up in the prior verses of chapter 15. That tells us verse 40, Paul chose Silas and so forth. So then came he, Paul, to Derby and Lystra. Behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, 
um, which was a Jewish and believe, a Jewess, excuse me, and believe. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra in Iconium. Him, speaking of Timotheus, would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Okay, so now we come to Acts. Acts in here recorded as Luke, and uh, Luke records it for us. And so we read of Paul coming to Lystra and Derby. He, he arrives there and he crossed paths with Timothy. And certainly his family, first of all, where we learn right away that he is the son of a Jewess. And uh, that uh, being Eunice. And his father yet is a Greek. And so that's rather informative. It would appear that Luke, being the author of Acts and historian, does not have a close relationship with Timothy, Timothy and the family. However, conversely, from what Paul writes in his epistles, we learn that he had a significant, intimate uh, acquaintance with them. He, he gives some particulars that Luke doesn't even mention and so forth about the family and the history and things like that. So Luke also, as I said, lets us know that Timothy's father was a Greek. Now, we can make some conclusions. We don't know concretely, but likely, since he was a Greek, that he was either unconverted or he had died early on. We don't know for, for sure. Likely, he was unconverted. He probably held to Grecian beliefs and such like that, and yet he also allowed Eunice to hold to her Christian beliefs, whatever the case may be there, okay? Uh, Paul mentions later on his grandmother, his mother, but uh, is completely silent about Timothy's father. Only Luke mentions that here. Now, again, that may be because Timothy's father's passed away at this point, or he remains unconverted. We don't know, okay? But um, Lois and Eunice uh, were both Grecian. Their names testify to the reality. Their names are Grecian names. And so, yet we know that Eunice was a Jewess also. Luke mentions that and so forth. Now, it's neat to think about this because Eunice uh, is probably the first, excuse me, Lois was probably the first convert in her family. And so she began changing the family tree, if we could put it that way. She came to put her faith and trust. Maybe Eunice did at the same time or thereafter. Lois uh, witnessed to her daughter, and her daughter came to know Christ. Some have surmised, some uh, commentators, some historians, that she was one of the first converts in Asia. And so as the scriptures and the church of Jerusalem spread abroad and into Asian things, she was probably and was one of the first converts there. And so we see this family tree affected. We, we see See them impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, okay? And so we assume, obviously, that Lewis instructed, uh, uh, Lois instructed her daughter Eunice, and then they both settled on the mission to make sure that Timothy knew their Savior and had a part in the Christian faith. And so Timothy, uh, did you catch it what I said? Timothy was a disciple. He was well reported of as Paul arrived on the scene. And Paul noticed this young man. Wow, he's, uh, I want to take him on a trip. I want him to go with me as I plant churches, as I go on missions work. And I, I want him to go with me. I want Timothy to have a part in this. I believe God's hands upon him. God wants to use him and is going to. And so Paul takes him and goes with him. Now, let me encourage you and let me just point out something here. The home situation was likely not ideal. Probably having a saved mother, mother and an unbelieving father, or at the very least, a saved mother and an absent father, dead or gone or whatever the case may be. I'd encourage you this morning, the, the testimony and reputations of two mothers in this passage, 2 Timothy chapter 1, of Eunice and Lois, and one was not only a mother but a grandmother, but the reality is in spite of their challenging home situation, a less than imperfect environment they were successful mothers where it counted. They were successful. And we hear so much today about environment and the perfect situation. Well, that child is just a, a product of their environment. Boy, a broken home and this type of uh, influence. Oh, it's just so terrible. Can I tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ can overcome any of it. And so moms, fathers, anybody here, you're trying to raise children. You're saying, well, I don't have the help here. I don't, I don't have this person participating or this spouse. There is good news that God can use you to instill the gospel in your children, 
to teach it and train it in them. And I love this truth. Mothers and even grandmothers, I encourage you today how powerful your influence for good can be in spite of challenges, obstacles, uh, uh, opposition in your home and your family. Maybe today, let's be honest, let's just, uh, let's just call it like it is sometimes. Let's be real. Maybe today you are the sole, only spiritual influence in the lives of your children today. Can I tell you, it can be enough and you can be successful. You can. Maybe today in your home, the dad is not there. Maybe he's just not a good spiritual leader. Maybe he's passive in the spiritual realm in your family. And much of the spiritual nourishment, responsibility, and instruction falls to you. It can be enough, and you can be successful with God's help. You can do it. Maybe there are those in the family that not just aren't participating, but they're fighting against you. Maybe they stand in opposition. Maybe they're trying to lessen your influence spiritually in the lives of your children. And you feel that you are constantly in a battle, constantly fighting. And in every ground you gain, you fought blood, sweat, and tears in the lives of your children. Every little inch of ground you gain spiritually, you feel like, man, it's just a constant battle. May I tell you, it can be enough and you can be successful with God's help. Keep at it. Keep at it. I love the mention here, and I do not think it is by accident of Eunice and Lois and the encouragement that they, they are to every one of us, mothers, fathers, the influence that we can have for the Lord. You see, Lois and Eunice and their impact on Timothy is a great encouragement for us today. So we want to learn from them today. What can we learn from them that will be helpful of us, for us as parents, especially mothers? Well, I'd put it in the form of two questions. Because I think we learned something great about Lois and Eunice from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and the other passages. Okay? The first is this. Here's the question. Okay? How will you be remembered as a mom? How will you be remembered as a mom? Okay? Now, l let's qualify that a little bit. The reality is this. All right? We know human memory is fallible. <laughs> Okay? I like that we read this in the Bible. What do we know about all Scripture? All Scripture is given by inspiration. Right? It is God given, God breathed. And so the reality is, as Paul says this, I remember, and he writes that, verse 5, we'll read it here in a moment. He says to Timothy, I, I remember your mother, and I remember your grandmother, and what they did to spiritually impact you. Now listen to me, that wasn't just Paul speaking, that was God speaking. And my friend, mothers here today, can I encourage you? You ought to care most how God remembers you as a mother. How God remembers you. And that's what we're speaking of here. So when we ask this question, we know that human uh, memory is, can sometimes be fallible. Sometimes your children don't always remember everything that you've done and everything you've instilled in them. It, it, it can be skewed, shall we say. This is talking about how will God remember you? And those who are walking in the faith, how will they remember you too, as even Paul demonstrates here? I think it's pretty amazing. More than celebrities and athletes and famous people, I think mothers are some of the most remembered people on earth. It's funny how many famous people talk about their mothers. <laughs> how many celebrities talk about their mothers. How many athletes, and, and they talk about their mom and so forth. They, they're the most, some of the most remembered people on earth, and I, I think that's good. Each of us ought to have fond memories of our mothers. I hope you can. Obviously, not everyone does. I, I understand that. Uh, I trust that God can comfort you even on a day like today. And sometimes Mother's Day can not only bring comfort, but it can also bring up past hurt. I, I understand that. But aren't you thankful our God is greater than all that? And He can comfort, and you can cast all your cares on Him. He careth for you. In spite of what you've done or in spite of what you faced and what you've experienced, maybe your mother wasn't everything a mother should be. I hope there are still some fond memories you have, some things you can remember. And we often remember all that they do for us. And uh, ladies sing about that unconditional love of mothers, I, I, their tireless care. I, my goodness, I think mothers uh, have uh, extra batteries somewhere, amen, and uh, they just keep going. Here are some, some ways that different people remembered their mom. I like these. And so, as I said, I like to share some different things. But here, here are some memories that people have of their mother. Maybe you have similar ones. Maybe not. I, I like this one. My mother's menu consisted of two choices, take it or leave it. It's pretty good, amen? Maybe some of your moms are like that, okay? <laughs> On the reverse side of that, this is pretty good. The most remarkable thing about my mother is that for 30 years, she served the family nothing but leftovers. 
the original meal has never been found. <laughs> so for those of us who like loaf leftovers, there you go. And uh, moms, you make them stretch. Amen. Good job. Okay. I think this is true. I think that this is probably a, a, a valid statement, right? Nothing is truly lost until mom can't find it. <laughs> How many kids ask mom, where's this? Where's this? Can you find this? And I'm, I, I think that's a pretty appropriate one. I think that's good. One, uh, one child remember about their mother, a funny occurrence story that happened. <laughs> um, says this, as we pulled into the parking lot one time, we saw a couple of people looking under the hood of their car. Concerned, my mom wondered out loud, do you think they have a flat tire? It's all right, moms. We still love you. You may not know your way around a car, but we still love you. Amen. One mother, mother remembered this about her own mother as a grandmother to her children. See, uh, one of the, the grandchildren wrote, uh, I'll miss you, grandmother. And this was in an email before that child, that grandson, shipped off to Iraq as a soldier. So obviously going where fighting was and everything else. Well, the grandmother wrote back and wrote this. and it says, I'll miss you too, dear. Stay safe, LOL, Grandma. This daughter simply said this, poor mom didn't realize that LOL doesn't stand for lots of love. <laughs> so laugh out loud in case you didn't know, okay? So not the thing to say when your grandson's shipping off to Iraq, okay? And talking about safety, all right? <laughs> It's funny what we think about and what moms sometimes think. We still love your moms. We still think you know everything, Amen. Kids think moms know everything, know where everything is. And many of you here today can add similar memories. We can you know, share our own memories about our mothers. I, I, I think of my mother fondly. I remember one of the things I remember vividly in my mind is sitting in a church service like this and leaning in against my mother and the comfort of her shoulder and everything else. And I remember that as a small child. I, I remember my mom teaching me how to pick blackberries and then heading inside and making a delicious blackberry cobbler. And I remember that. I remember her making all my favorite meals. I remember uh, her introducing me to sautéed mushrooms. Oh, I love mushrooms. Fungus. Mm. And uh, I love mushrooms with butter, a little salt, and so forth. She introduced me to that, got me hooked on that. And I remember, as many of you can relate to this, I, my mom, I remember my mom teaching me how to shut corn. You ever shut corn? And uh, make sure you get all that silk off and everything else. Another thing, I remember sitting in the backyard and uh, a couple lawn chairs, and my mom taught me how to break and string string beans. All right, get that string down the side, break them off, get them ready for canning and all all those things. And boy, our parents teach us a lot, don't they? Certainly, I remember my mom teaching me about the Bible and the Scripture and Bible-based songs, teach me those and, and just uh, telling me about the Lord. And today, as I'm a father now, Erica does all the same things with our children and teaches them many different things from the, uh, the smallest of things like how to tie a shoe to the important things of teaching the Bible and such like that. We all have great memories of our parents of our mothers and what they've taught us and how they've instilled in us. But Paul brings up under the leadership and the guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says this to Timothy. Look again in verse number five. Notice what he says. Verse number five, Second Timothy chapter one. When I call to remembrance, here he says, I'm remembering this. What am I remembering about Timothy, your mother and grandmother, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. I love that statement. He says, listen, Timothy, yeah, I, maybe he could say, I remember all the good meals your mom fixed when I was in Lystra and Derby. I, maybe I remember uh, how your mom doted on you. and whatever. He doesn't mention all that. Here he is. He says this. This is what I remember. These are the things I remember about your mom. Here's how I remember her. And, and it's a good statement about how moms ought to be remembered. Again, First of all, in God's eyes, that's what we're talking about. But how should a mom be remembered? Well, here's what the passage tells us. Number one, be remembered, okay, be remembered for what you instilled an unfeigned faith. That's what verse 5 says. Be remembered as a mother in God's eyes for what you instilled in your children. That's the unfeigned faith. That's what he says to Timothy. Your mother instilled in you that same unfeigned faith that she had, that your grandmother had. It was passed down the family tree. You want to change your family tree? Best way to do that is with the good news of Jesus Christ. They pass it down and instill in them the unfeigned faith. And I love that terminology of unfeigned. It's a great statement, and it means quite a bit packed into one, one word, okay, and that adjective that he uses. It literally means sincere undisguised and without hypocrisy. Sincere 
undisguised and without hypocrisy. Can I tell you, what a heritage, what a great hand-me-down. This is the definition of success in the eyes of heaven. It's not that you leave your children a huge bank account. It's not that you make them successful in the world. No, in heaven's eyes, the best way to be remembered is that you instilled in them an unfeigned faith. And that's a great description of what that faith should look like. Number one, it's genuine. It's a sincere faith. What does that mean? It's an obvious personal relationship that they have with God. I, I don't want my children, uh, Erica doesn't want our children talking about their parents' God. We want them talking about their God. It's genuine. It's real to them. That, it, it is personable. It is their own thing that they, they have a relationship. It is sincere. It is real. It is genuine. Passing that on. Number two, we see the terminology undisguised. This is who they are. Uh, it's not something hidden. It's what they are. They are a child of God, a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a truth that they don't hide from anyone. They don't go to the workplace and no one there knows they're a Christian. They're not out in the world every other day and no one there really knows that they follow Jesus Christ. No, it's obvious in how they live. It's obvious in how they talk. It's obvious in how they conduct themselves. It is an unfeigned faith. When Paul showed up to Lystra and Derby, he saw right away that this Timothy, in fact, we said that it is well reported of. He was well reported of. He had an unfeigned faith, undisguised. Though in an area, in a place where they could have gotten persecuted for following Jesus Christ, here are people whose faith was obvious. And it was clear to everyone who they followed. What a joy it is as a parent to be able to pass that kind of faith onto your children. Unfeigned faith. It's sincere and genuine. It's undisguised. And obviously the next statement is and what unfeigned means without hypocrisy. No double living. No um, two-facedness. A consistent testimony of living by faith in God. Living for him. Living in such a way that is, uh, bespeaks a follower of Jesus Christ. For all that I know and remember uh, my mother passing on to me, I'm thankful that her and my father passed on their faith. If you're here today and you had parents that are saved, you ought to be thankful for the faith they passed on. As they led you and brought you up in such a way to please the Lord. I'm thankful as Erica uh, uh, teaches and passes on to our children uh, that unfeigned faith. You say as a, as a husband, what do you appreciate most about your wife as a mother it's her continual passing on of her faith in our Savior to our children in a myriad of ways, day after day after day after day. Mom, can I tell you right now, one of the greatest responsibilities, yea, one of the greatest privileges you have is to instill in your children an unfeigned faith. It's genuine. It's sincere. It's real. It's undisguised. It's without hypocrisy. Great privilege but a great responsibility. And I love it that Paul mentions here, hey, Timothy, man, your mom, your grandmother, this is how I remember them. More importantly, this is how God remembers them. <laughs> they, they passed this on, they gave it to you, and I, I am persuaded that it dwells in you also. What a great statement, what a great memory. Turn with me over just a couple chapters. Let's see something else quickly. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Look there, we'll dump, jump down to verse 15. Paul mentions something else here, okay, that was indicative uh, of uh, Eunice and Lois and what they had done in Timothy's life. Look at verse number 15 of chapter 3. It says this, in that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So number one, be remembered for what you instilled, that's unfeigned faith. Number two, be remembered for what you instructed, the holy scriptures. Be remembered for what you've instructed, the holy scriptures. Here's a great testimony and memory of Timothy's mother. Paul tells Timothy, you, you've heard these scriptures. You've learned them from the time you were a child. Your mother made it her goal to instruct you in these, in these scriptures. And that's a powerful statement we come to here in this passage. He's looking back and saying, Timothy, you've known these. You've heard them from being a child. And no doubt, as we've already understood, that Eunice and Lois, this was due to them and their faithfulness to Eunice, his mother, instilling or instructing in him the Holy Scriptures. 
Now, we praise the Lord for the local church. We praise the Lord for Sunday school and every Sunday school teacher and junior church and Pats and Pee Wee, all the, the ministries of the local church. We, we praise the Lord for the Christian school and all of these things that teach our children the Bible. But nothing replaces or beats a mother who teaches her children the Word of God. Moms, you hear me? Back in the Old Testament, we hear often where we read of the reality that God instructed the Jews that it is the family's responsibility, is the home's responsibility to instill an unfeigned faith and to instruct in the Holy Scriptures. You talk about them in the way as you're sitting up, as you're sitting down. You talk about the Word of God. You instruct them in the Holy Scriptures. And what do we hold to? The promise that when God's Word will not return, void. We cling to such promises that his word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of uh, morrow, uh, of soul and spirit. The reality, this, this is God's word. It's powerful. It is useful. So instruct them in it. Find ways. Just teach them God's word. I love it when I hear Erica referencing God's Word in conversations with our children, helping one of our children learn a verse. And many of you who have school children, moms, you've helped your children learn verses and memorize them. And maybe you've taught some on your own. Maybe in discipline or in chastening, you've taught them different verses about different things, instructions from God's Word. I remember fondly my own mother doing the same with me. What does it mean? It involves holding God's Word, the Scriptures, in high esteem, uh, making it your personal handbook for life. You cite it regularly. You reference it regularly. You look to it in your own life, and then you allow it to trickle down to them in your interactions. This is what you do with God's Word. You cherish it on such a level that it is your handbook for life. You reference it. You speak of it. You talk of it, and they hear it. You instruct them in it, the Holy Scriptures. And Paul's building on that. Timothy, as a pastor, as a preacher, do you remember all the scriptures you learned? One of the things I remember growing up, obviously my, my mother teaching, but um, a plethora of verses memorized both at home and throughout church. Awana, many of you participated in Awana, and you memorized verses just as I did time and time again. In other classes, we had neighborhood Bible time for vacation Bible school, and boy, they had this super, super long list of Bible verses and so forth. What a great reality and foundation of having the Holy Scriptures uh, given to us, us instructed in the Holy Scriptures. Moms, can I encourage you? One of the greatest things you can do, one of the best things you can be remembered for is instructing your children in God's Word. You're on the front lines. You see them every day. You see them at, your, at their worst. You have to experience them when they give in to the flesh. What a great time to bring out God's Word, to cite it, to reference it, to quote it. Instruct them in it as you're teaching them. I'd encourage you to join Jeremiah in living with God's Word as your greatest treasure so that it will impact your children. What did Jeremiah say? You remember, thy words were found and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Do your children know how much you value God's Word? Does it come out in the obviousness of you teaching them and always quoting scriptures and always referencing, well, God's Word says this, God said this, remember this Bible verse, and you're just instructing and teaching, and Paul now is saying to Timothy, you remember all those days? You remember when your mom, Eunice, used to quote scriptures to you? She used to tell you that God doesn't want this, and God's heart is this, and this pleases God, and God said this? And even your grandmother would pile on too, tag team you. Share some scripture and instruct you in the Holy Scripture. Mom, can I encourage you to make it your goal to be remembered, most importantly, by God for instructing your children in the Scriptures. Look at verse 14 of the same passage. We'll see a third thing. We are encouraged, obviously, to, as we said, instill in them an unfeigned faith, instruct them in the Holy Scriptures. And then we look at verse number 14. Is this, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. These verses go together. He's referencing, Paul is, listen, you've learned some things. You've been taught some things. Your mom and your grandmother and others have, have poured into you. They've invested in you. Number three, be remembered for what you incited. For what you incited. Continuing in the ways of the Lord. But continue thou. Continue. What you've instilled in uh, unfeigned faith. What you instructed, the Holy Scriptures. And then number three, be remembered for what you've incited. Continue in the ways of the Lord. 
I love the, the, the thought that Paul is here. In the passage, you remember what he's saying? You can look to verse number uh, 13 in previous things. Evil men, seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Deceivers are going to come. It's setting the table for the Antichrist. And it's just getting ready for all that's going to happen. And, and there's just going to be heretics and false teachers and everything else out there. But you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned. Rough days are coming. Many people try to influence you for the wrong and the, and the bad. Try to deceive you. Don't let that happen. Continue in the ways that you have what? Been taught. How long have you been taught them? You've been taught them since you were a child. Since you were a child. Now by the time we can infer, okay, we can infer from the scriptures in Acts 16 that by the time that Paul meets Timothy, he is probably older. At the very least, an older teen. At the very least, that maybe, maybe he's even college age, whatever the case may be. But at some point, when Timothy crossed paths with uh, Paul, Paul says, man, I want to take you with me on a trip. I want you to go on a mission work with me. I want you to go plant churches that he is probably older at least. But Paul's saying here, man, there's one thing I know. There's one thing I remember, Timothy. <laughs> Your mother has always encouraged you to continue in the way of the Lord. She's incited it in you. I like that word incite. What does it mean? The word incite means to provoke or to urge. Hey, moms, do you ever have to push your kids along? How about this? Time to go to school. Time to get ready. Time to get out of bed. This is the fourth time I'm telling you. That, whatever it is, you have to ever urge them. You ever have to provoke them. Hey, it's time to go get a job. It's time to do this. It's time to clean your room. It's time to wash your hands. It's time to come inside. Provoking and urging, inciting, pushing them along. Literally, what Paul says here, and certainly Timothy's mother did. What do we know? Don't miss it. Timothy's mom set him on the right direction. She aimed him well in passing along that unfeigned faith, teaching him the Holy Scriptures. And he got, she got him started on his way. Now, don't miss this. Then she did something that good mothers do. She became his greatest cheerleader. She became his greatest cheerleader. And you can just imagine all along the way, and if we could read the letters that as Timothy left with Paul that Eunice wrote, and probably the lowest two, is just encouraging. Now, Timothy, make sure you, you wash your clothes, brush your teeth, and may you always walk with the Lord. Timothy, continue in his ways. T Timothy, don't let up. You keep living for God. God has always been faithful to us, Timothy. You know this. God has always stayed true to us, Timothy. You stay true to him. There is no greater thing than you can do to serve him, to serve our Savior. You can imagine the letters that Eunice and Lois probably wrote. You can imagine the encouragement all along the way, the cheerleaders that they were for him. It's a provoking and urging to do right, to live out that faith, to stay the course, to continue in the ways of the Lord. Timothy is saying what? She taught you, Timothy. Your mom taught you. She pushed you along. She's urged you to continue. Man, mothers are so good at doing that, to urge, to provoke, to incite. And to be remembered as a mother that never gave up on your children doing right. A mother that never stopped encouraging your children to do right. That always kept pushing forward, pushing them forward to do what is right. My friend, mother, may I tell you, that's priceless. That's priceless. To be remembered for what you taught them. How you're always encouraging them and provoking. Continue, continue. Don't give up. Make it your goal to be remembered first by heaven. For inciting your children to continue in the ways of the Lord. Now real quick, we just have a couple minutes left and we'll be done. Let me just share you through the second question real quick. Number one, how will you be remembered? Number two is this, what is your mission as a mom? What is your mission as a mom? Purposeful mothering doesn't happen without a plan. It doesn't happen without a mission objective. So what are you trying to accomplish in the lives of your children? It, 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 it's a good question to ask. What are you doing to accomplish it too? What are you trying to accomplish and what are you doing to accomplish it? What is the mission of your motherhood? How will you be remembered certainly flows into this, but what is your mission as a mom? Real quick, on a funny note, here's some things that mothers say about their goals and how they go about parenting their children. Um, one, one parent said this. Now, these aren't all good in the sense of good parenting techniques, but uh, here's one goal that one parent had. This is what she said. I want my children to have all the things I couldn't afford, then I want to move in with them. Yeah, I get that. 
Okay. One mother said about her own ability and power, she said this, uh, my, my mom's superpower is being the only person in the house who can see an empty toilet paper roll. So help your mom out. Okay. I like this one. <laughs> one mother said, I would like to officially apologize to my toddler for opening her granola bar from the top instead of the bottom. I don't know what I was thinking. You ever have a kid tell you you're not doing it right? I have, right? A little child, and like, have I not lived much longer than you, right? <laughs> so it is true, okay? <laughs> this is uh, good advice. If your kids are giving you a headache, follow the directions on the aspirin bottle, especially the part that says, keep away from children. <laughs> that might help, right? <laughs> Dad, you're on duty, amen? And uh, <laughs> last but not least, when my kids become wild and unruly, I use a nice, safe playpen. When they're finished, I climb out. <laughs> Probably not the best parenting technique, but I, I get it, don't you? And any of us that are parents. But let's put the mission quickly of a godly mother into words from the Scripture. Real quick, just two things and we're done. Number one, train your child in the ways of the Lord. Obviously, Eunice and Lois were dem uh, demonstrative of this and uh, demonstrated it for us, okay? Train up a child in the way, way he should go. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. In other words, be a drill sergeant. Some of your mothers are the greatest drill sergeants. You train them in so many things and do such a great job of it. Well, apply that now too and make sure you're doing it likewise with training a child in the ways of the Lord. Training them up when the way should go. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, mothers and fathers, and I think it's a dual command there to bring them, uh, your children, up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The word for nurture there is training, is a word for training, okay? Train them in the things of the Lord. And the word for admonition, now this is interesting, the word for admonition is to put in one's mind. Put in one's mind. Put in their mind the ways of the Lord. Again, instilling in them unfeigned faith, instructing them in holy scriptures, and then inciting them to continue in the ways of the Lord. It's a great truth. The instructing and instilling of these things. Now, read, uh, look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Real quick, again, uh, uh, we'll hurry here and be done. Verse 6, uh, and uh, actually verse, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 8, if you will. Look with me there. It says this, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Verse 8, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. There's that unfeigned faith, okay? okay? Notice what else he says, nor me a prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Last point, don't miss it. Number one, what is your mission? It ought to be, number one, train up your children in the ways of God. Number two, turn your children over to the will of the Lord. Train them up in the ways of the Lord, then turn your children over to the will of the Lord. You see, having heard of Paul probably, or at least coming to know Paul, when he came to Lystra and Derby and, and heard of his plans for missions work, you can imagine Eunice, uh, as she entrusted Timothy to Paul, she knew what she was doing. When she understood that, that Paul was going to take him in full-time ministry, that he was going to go out on missions work, he was going to go plant churches in cities where they'd face persecution, and, and, and Paul already suffering some things, she, she knew what she was doing. She wasn't just giving her son uh, to a, a missionary, a traveling missionary. She was turning her son over to the Lord, his will. She had trained him up in the ways of the Lord. Now, for some, the hardest part. I'm going to turn them over to the Lord. Whatever the Lord has, whatever the Lord wills, I, I want you to, in, in fact, you can imagine she encouraged him in serving in the God. May I just tell you this morning, may, may I just be frank, we need more Eunices and Hannahs today that will willingly give their children to the Lord. Offering them up for whatever God would have them to do and be. We need mothers that will encourage the children to serve the Lord, to give their all to Him, to live for Him. And if He chooses such for them, to walk away from everything else in life, to give their lives in service to our King and our Lord. I truly believe that a big reason that Timothy was a preacher, uh, that he was a pastor serving God with his life because his mother willingly, joyously, turned her son over to God for whatever he would choose to do for him or have him to do and however he would choose to use him. 
I have witnessed when parents have this attitude, when they embrace, Lord, we want your will for our children, it affects the willingness of their children to serve God. I'll just be honest with you. It's, it, having gone to Bible college and grown up in a pastor's home and so forth, one of the things several decades ago, we ran into Bible college, a lot of people who we would call this, it's kind of funny, we called them mama called preachers. You ever hear that term? Mama called preachers. Because if there was a time that we went through, especially in the United States, where the ministry was magnified, the ministry was glorified, and going in that, which was not a bad thing, he that desireth the office of a bishop desireth what? A good thing. A good thing, the Scripture says. So that's a great thing. But there were some who ended up in Bible college. They weren't God called. They were mama called. You ought to go in the ministry. That would be the best thing for you. you to, that's, man, that's great. You should do that. And we need more preachers. Out of pure motives, no doubt, most of them. But they were mama-called preachers, not God-called preachers. And it's kind of funny, you know. And, and uh, boy, the mom, mama has power, amen. She puts influence on people. And she just impacts them and calls. Now, it's funny. I think we've almost come for full circle. You see, what I mean by that is I believe some parents have not turned their children over to God and his will. They have not willingly and openly encouraged their children to give their lives wholly to God. And therefore, the ranks of full-time servants of God are growing thin. So moms, I'd ask you, have you said in a prayer, God, I want your will for my child? I'll put them up on the altar. I'll surrender to them. I'll do my part. I will train them up in the way of the Lord. I will make sure I instill in them my unfeigned love, uh, faith. I, I will instruct them in the Holy Scriptures, and I will incite them, provoke them, urge them to continue in the ways of God, but I'll also turn them over to you. Have you done that? Moms and dads alike. One of the greatest responsibilities of fathers and mothers alike is to train their children in the ways of God and then to turn them over to the will of God. Lord, whatever you want to do with them, wherever you want to take them, if they'll be a missionary halfway across the world, if they'll be a, a preacher, a pastor here in the United States, if they'll be a, a deacon, if they'll be a Sunday school teacher and have a secular job, Father, whatever your will is, I want it for them and I will encourage them to follow your will. Have you done that, mother? Does your child know that your greatest heart's desire for them is to serve your God with everything they have? This morning, Erica didn't know my message or anything like that. We are sitting there, a couple of kids were eating breakfast, we are in the kitchen, and one of the kids said, Happy Mother's Day, and I've got a card for you, something like that. And Erica just simply made the statement, The one thing I want from you is you to always serve the Lord. And I dare say there's mothers all across this auditorium that, truth be told, you'd say the same thing. Is that true? Have you said that to your children? All I want is for you to love the Lord and serve him with all your heart, soul, might. Have you trained them up in God's ways? And have you turned them over to God's will for their life? Mothers, we're thankful for you. We love you. You have the greatest impact in the lives of our children than anybody. I truly believe that. So how will you be remembered by heaven? And what is your mission today?